We're the backbone behind global business. And when they need capital, uh, we fund it. It's one of the world's largest alternative investment companies. Brookfield owns hydroelectric plants, cell phone towers, power lines, wind farms, ports, and even city skylines. Bruce Flatt has been at the helm for more than two decades, overseeing more than $900 billion of assets under management. The veteran chief executive is considered a visionary investor with a golden touch. But for him, it's all about patience and finding the right investments. What you might think of as risky, to us it's not risky because we've been in this business for these businesses for a long period of time. In this episode of Leaders with LACWA, I speak to Bruce Flatt about the secrets of his success, the outlook for commercial real estate, and his own future. Bruce Flett, thank you so much for coming on Leaders. How are you? I'm great because I'm speaking to you. Brookfield has gone from like strength to strength. If I was a Martian meeting you for the first time, how would you describe your company? We uh, invest in, buy, and own uh, the backbone of the global economy. Uh, when the water gets delivered to your house, the road you drive on, the pipeline that brings uh, different things to your uh, community, uh, the telecom towers that transmit your phone, the data center, um, the real estate that you live in. Um, it's what we own and, and build, so it's, it's really what drives the economy, and you don't often see our name. Uh, Is that a good or a bad thing? It, you know, it's just because we're behind the scenes, but it's big, with a trillion dollars of assets almost. Um, we're, we're behind a lot of the things of the global economy. So being low key, do you think it gives you strength? We just try to be quiet and do our um, thing. And some, sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't. But uh, I'd say on balance, it's been good for us. So you've been in charge for 22 years at Brookfield. Yes, that seems like a long time when you say it that way. <laughs> two decades, over two decades. What was the most interesting transit? I mean, you've grown the business by so much. What was the most difficult question about how to grow it? Look, the, uh, the amazing thing about this business is uh, you learning every day. And the world's changing all the time. But if I went back 22 years or 32 years, what we invested in then and now are very different. Data centers didn't exist then. Um, telecom towers were owned by all the phone companies. So these are things that the business evolves and the backbone evolves of the economy. So it's, it's a really interesting business to be in because you're always learning. But it's a difficult business because you don't want to be Kodak, right? You don't want to invest in something that goes nowhere. Yeah, look, we're always trying to understand um, where is the future going and how do we invest with that? And, and often oh. it's listening to your counterparties, <laughs> uh, your clients, your partners, uh, and, and hearing what they're saying and what they want to do and we're going with them. And, uh, and that's really, we're, we're the backbone behind global business mm -hmm. and when they need capital, uh, we fund it. And I think your North Star, as it were, is, is three Ds, right? Yeah, look, I'd say uh, over time, we're always trying to figure out well, what are the things that are gonna, what are the themes? Right. They're going to drive the world, and uh, and today the digitalization of everything, the decarbonization of everything, and the deglobalization of everything, are three, I'd say, mega trends themes mm -hmm. that are going to um, be very dominant in investing for the next not not the next two or three years, the next twenty mm -hmm. to thirty years. Geopolitics is, I guess, taking a turn for the worse. How do you, again, keep that trajectory and saying, look, we, we will digitize, interest rates are also all over the place, so how do you stay the course, as it were? You know, Francine, what we try to do is find good countries, mm -hmm. go there and stay there, invest in these things, and whether governments come or go, or interest rates go up a little bit or down a little bit, um, uh, aren't really relevant to these themes in the long term. You need to make sure you have liquidity, uh, you can fund yourself, and you run good businesses. And that's more important than those general trends. So we're, trying, we're investing right. for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So out of the three Ds, is digitalization the hardest because of AI, because we don't really know where we'll end up? Look, I, I'd say digitalization was happening because of cloud computing, 
um, and the super tech companies getting into cloud computing, and that was the whole thing going on. The amount of things that go to your iPad every day today in your it's phone. It's crazy. It's amazing yeah. what's happened yeah. in the past 20 years. But yeah. now with AI, it's just, it's yeah. almost exponentially taken it up. And, uh, and so I, that's just another tailwind behind this whole sector. It was very strong yeah. before that. And for the last yeah. five, seven, uh, 10 years, we had been pushing into it. Yeah. But the AI, what's going on with AI is even more dramatic. The digitalization of everything um, is being driven by data centers and just the connectivity of everything. But remember, everyone in the world has um, in some way committed to let's have less carbon. Yeah. And it's just transitioning the economy. It's not, it's not good or bad or green or black. It's just let's just transition the economy to have less carbon. So we're funding that, and the leaders in that today are the technology companies, so a lot of this is being driven by the technology companies to go um, green, so we're one of the largest builders of solar uh, and wind and now batteries to be able to get carbon out of the system. And whereas years ago we sell power to the grid, today it's mo our power is mostly sold to global corporates. But the, and again, this is you have to take a bet on what kind of technology or do you have to take a bet on, on just the infrastructure we that supports it? We were doing uh, wind 15, 18, 20 mm -hmm. years ago. We were doing solar 10 years ago, but very small. And mm -hmm. only when the cost curves made mm -hmm. solar and wind um, at the point where they were, e they're the most economic thing, way to generate electricity. And at the point of that, you know, if they're the most economic way to do it, and they have less carbon, they're going to win. And that, that's why we're decarbonizing today, because in most countries, this is the lowest cost energy. But geopolitics must get in the way, right? Politicians have to be reelected. They're, they're pro-climate change, against climate change. How do you, how do you not waver? Uh, remember, what, it, it just, just the important point. In most countries, the lowest cost energy today for electricity is solar or wind. You don't need subsidies. And when you did need subsidies, politics mattered. Today, you don't. Deglobalization. So this is what bringing back onshoring. All it is is, um, I think in COVID, I'd say it, it's always been happening. And in COVID, people just learned we should have production capacity located in uh, many things located where you use them. So increasingly, for example, batteries um, for cars, for example. Um, they're being used in America, and therefore there are battery plants getting built mm -hmm. in America, and there's an enormous need for capital to fund battery plants. There's enormous need mm -hmm. for semiconductors, an enormous need for manufacturing capacity in various locations around the world. And it's just natural that mm -hmm. everyone doesn't want to have all of their manufacturing capacity in one mm -hmm. country or place. Let's diversify. So that's a, just a big theme, which means it's just a lot of capital. You make it sound very easy, but actually this has gotten you like more than 900 billion in assets under management. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not easy, but if you um, have operating people and you t keep repeatable, do repeatable things around the world, it gets easy, it gets simpler. It's not easy, but it's simpler. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I guess that's, that's why we're in business, right? It, um, we've been doing this a long time. Um, and uh, everything's not the same, but uh, it's, there, are, there are a lot of things that rhyme, and therefore you can learn and continue to grow over time. Coming up, Bruce Flatt on plans to invest in the financial backbone of the global economy. We think that's the next, um, the next phase of infrastructure investing. Infrastructure has been a bright spot for Brookfield. The company is gathering cash for a new fund targeting buyout opportunities in the Middle East. And it plans to start a pool that invests in financial infrastructure, such as payment systems, as demand grows. I continue the conversation with Bruce Flatt. Did you know in 2002 that you wanted to, to be at 900 billion? Asset under management or a trillion? We're just trying to make money for our clients. 
in a thoughtful way, and we've done that for a long period of time. And the reason why we are at the scale we are is because we've been thoughtful with their money and we've earned them a good return. And we've not taken a lot of risk. And uh, if you can do that over long periods mm -hmm. of time, you can compound their wealth, mm -hmm. uh, investment wealth, um, to very large sums of money. And that's, that's what's important for these sovereign institutional mm -hmm. pension investors because they have very long durations. They need these type of assets to uh, earn them returns over the longer term. You've also gone to credit. H how much are you expecting that to grow? Look, what's, what's happened with regulations in the banking system is they've just, um, it's pushed out credit off the balance sheets of the banks and the right place where that is uh, being funded from is institutional investors. And therefore, uh, investors like ourselves are continuing to grow our businesses where we're funding these type of products. Um, uh, but it's not, uh, our, our business is not in competition with the banks, it's actually right. in partnership right. with the banks. And uh, as a result of that, I'd say it's facilitating the, the growth of the global yeah. financial markets as opposed to something that often people talk about it right. that uh, we're at the wrong time in the cycle or whatever it is. This is going to be growing and happening for a long yeah. period of time. So, so how big do you expect? It's going to get big. Because remember, this is, this is where most of the capital is in the world, is in sovereign institutional yeah. funds yeah. Um, these, and pensions. The, these funds are, used to be 20 and 30 billion. Today they're 300 billion, 500 billion, a trillion trillion and a half dollars. These are large, large sums of money. They need to put it to work and um, therefore it's going to continue to grow for a long period of time. And are you focused, when you look at regions, is it mainly the GCC countries? We invest for people in the, for the long term, try to earn them good returns by taking moderate risk and yeah. if we can do that, it's all around the world. For you, what you want to do in your own portfolio is take moderate risk and earn a good return. But Bruce, what's moderate risk? So do, again, again, you make it sound easy, but actually this is a, a know-how. So do, do you look into, you know, you're also quite acquisitive. Yeah, look, I would say we, um, in the businesses that we are in, we have more information than most people about what we do. Therefore, what you might think of as risky, to us it's not risky because right. we've been in this business for, these businesses for a long period of time. We have the information of everything. We know, we know what's getting shipped across the ocean in our containers. We know what's getting booked into the ports in different countries. We know what, what's traveling on the roads. We know what the, who, how many people are going into a shopping mall. We know all of those things and that just informs us. So we have, I'd say, better information to base our decisions than most people and um, but we're always you know we're trying to take we're, so we're trying to lower the risks by doing that um, of course you can investing investing's tough it's not easy and therefore you're always taking some form of risk how do you choose what company to buy you know, thoughtful analysis about what's in the business uh, proper pricing when things are up a lot just wait <laughs> and uh, most people invest at the wrong time because they get excited about what the markets are telling them about a business. Uh, and therefore, we're, that's usually when we're not investing um, and just wait for the time when it'll be a little uh, better to invest. Do, do you expect, I mean, I think you've spoken in the past about, you know, a possible big acquisition that would be transformational for Brookfield. Do you know, I, I would say we're always in the, we're always looking for um, additions to the business. Uh, in 2018, we brought uh, Oak Tree uh, into our fold, and we have a partnership uh, with the management there. Um, that's been tr uh, uh, transformative to our credit business, uh, and uh, we're always looking for things like that to continue to build the business uh, and and just grow over time. And and but if not, we'll just we just keep plugging away every day. So this is, so it's more partnerships than outright acquisitions like Altera. Is that, I mean, this is a different kind of c carbon fund. Our uh, tr uh, transition business, we started, uh, we, sp we split off from our yeah. main infrastructure business uh, four and a half, four or five years ago. Um, uh, we raised a large uh, first time fund. We just did a, a, a first close of our yeah. second fund for $10 billion. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, um, we started an emerging markets business. So that, I'd say that's just I a see. split off. Right. This is just, right. Right. All, all we're trying to do is we, 
we informed ourselves about transition. Yeah. We built a team over a long period of time. Now, our, some people said to us, can you solve emerging markets as opposed to just develop markets? Right. We didn't feel it appropriate to put the two in the same fund, so we're creating another fund to do that. And some of our clients will come along with us, and, and we're quite excited about it. Is, is that a template for, for possible future kind of spin-offs? You know, we, uh, we have, uh, in our private equity business, we have a buyout sponsor uh, okay. business. Um, but we're also doing, uh, uh, we've, we're just in the midst of uh, creating a strategy for uh, the Middle East, which will be a separate pool of money. Uh, we're creating a strategy for financial infrastructure um, because we think that's the next, um, the next phase of infrastructure investing is in the financial backbone of the global economy. And ev a lot of the world has been pushing towards mm -hmm. financial infrastructure, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. not appropriate for our infrastructure fund. Right. But so, uh, so we're creating a new pool of money to do that. And yeah. so we, we're, there's a fine line between to having too many uh, <laughs> things and making sure your clients who want to be invested with you in that type of area mm -hmm. have, um, have a pool to be able to do it uh, with us. Bruce, when, when you look at infrastructure, I mean, there's a consolidation. It was really the, I guess, the name for the last six months. Is, does that make your job easier or tougher? Look, we, uh, we, we were the uh, maybe one, one, I'm going to say one of the pioneers of infrastructure. In the going original, you want to in, say. <laughs> well, going into institutional clients. We were the original because we were in industrial businesses mm -hmm. ourselves. And how we got into the infrastructure business is we decided we didn't like the up and down of many of the industrial businesses we had and mining businesses, but we really liked the backbone infrastructure that was in these businesses. And uh, but 20 years ago, we started doing it for institutional clients. At that time, yeah. nobody would listen to us and nobody would invest with us. So uh, it's quite, um, in, it's quite, it's great that they, that yeah. this has become mainstream today. Yeah. Um, the good news, I'd say we're still a leader in it. Uh, we have very large funds, in fact, the largest in the world. And therefore, um, we just continue to um, try to differentiate our um, investment strategies and with size, scale, yeah. operating people, uh, and the yeah. ability just to grow uh, in the places we are. So I think we're... Um, does, do others getting stronger uh, help us? Probably not, but it doesn't really bother us, and I think there's a place uh, for us to continue to grow uh, in the business. Coming up, why Bruce Flatt has faith in the future of commercial real estate. There's opportunity coming, and if you know what you're doing, you can pick the right assets. Um, there's a great opportunity here. From the United States to Europe, plunging office valuations are spooking investors, raising fears about a broader contagion. As one of the world's biggest owners of commercial real estate, Brookfield is at the center of a global industry shakeout. But the chief executive, Bruce Flatt, who made his name in real estate, sees opportunities where others see risks. We continue the conversation. Commercial real estate. So a lot of people say, look, this is, not the, this is not the right time. We're going to see a shakeout in commercial real estate. There are opportunities that you see. Yeah, I think, look, the next, the next story um, is that uh, interest rates are coming down. Fundamentals are pretty good in a lot of commercial real estate. Uh, of course, there are some, there's a tale of some investors that had properties mm -hmm. that for this environment, the fundamentals either don't support it or the financing they have can't be supported and therefore those have to get dealt with. So that's a tale that's getting dealt with within the financial system. Fundamentals are actually getting better. Mm -hmm. Interest rates are coming down, which means the values are going to improve. But, but that tale, there's opportunity coming. And if you know what you're doing, you can pick the right assets. Oh. Um, there's a great opportunity here and we, we've We've done this for a long period of time, and we've seen these cycles before. Real estate's cyclical, and uh, you can make a lot of money when you right. pick the inflection yeah. point of markets. And I, I remember it in the early uh, 90s, 
Uh, I remembered it in uh, early 2000s. I remembered it in 2009, 10, 11, 12. Um, there are points when uh, when there's an inflection point, yeah. and uh, we're at one of those inflection points. Today. So you're so you're buying. We, we are buying our opportunistic fund. We just bought some. We foreclosed on some loans for multifamily in the U.S. recently. Uh, we're very excited about that, um, and we continue to look at a bunch of uh, things. Do, do you see anything in Europe? Uh, absolutely. I think there'll be, uh, you know, the biggest, most liquid markets are in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean, uh, therefore, because they're the most liquid, you always find yeah. the most opportunities. But uh, exactly. Europe, there's less capital, and therefore it, there will be there will be opportunities here as well. But how do you make a difference between the, the ones that you know will get better and the ones that are actually you just you should forget? You know, I would just say it um, it depends on uh, the types of real estate. You just need to quality wins always. It always has. It always will. What do you spend most of your time thinking about? You know, I, I personally, I spend my time uh, sometimes helping our teams with business. Uh, sometimes, uh, th say a third of that, a third with clients, yeah. helping them uh, understand what we're doing, where we're going. Uh, and a third is um, just internal people running the organization, mm -hmm. I'll call it. And, uh, and with that, we, we spend an enormous amount of time uh, uh, building our people and transitioning our people within all of our businesses and it's just a this is not something that happens once it's happening all the time and our whole goal is our culture of our place is bring people up that are very young mm -hmm. give them opportunities mm -hmm. that they'd never get anywhere else grow them throughout the organization uh, make sure they're entrepreneurial hardworking and um, and want to win and, uh, and if you have that, you have a great culture in a company, and that's sort of what we spend all of our, a, a huge amount of our time mm -hmm. um, trying to build within the organization. But br bring them up to test them, or no. just to make them learn? Look, look I, if we can um, bring them up to take on roles, and uh, eventually, eventually I, will, uh, I will become an executive chairman, uh, and I'll still be around, but somebody else can will be around. Will you ever retire? Place. Well, you know, I will. <laughs> I will become an executive chairman at some point in time. And what that means is, I'm here to help mentor young people, help with business development, look after clients that that can be helpful to the overall organization. Mm -hmm. But at some point in time, it's this is a hard business. We're in 30 countries. We have lots of people. It's better to have younger people grow the business. I took over at 30 in my 30, early 30s, and, um, and I, I probably slower today than I was then. Uh, not that I've slowed down, but I'm slower today. And, and at some point in time, it's the right thing just to bring, to give the people those roles. And uh, so we're continually evolving the organization in that way. But are you going anywhere anytime soon? No. <laughs> Bruce, is, is this the, the, the biggest mistake, actually, for politicians and chief executives? Is, is staying on for too long? Or is, it, you know, is, is leadership in 2024 different to what it was in early 2000s? You know, I think it all depends on the organization. Some organizations fit one way, some fit another. I'm not suggesting our culture is what works for everybody else, but we have a culture where uh, our elders stay around for long periods of time to help. Uh, and our young people get opportunities which they wouldn't otherwise get if the elders stayed in place uh, in a full-time role. And that's what we do, but maybe it doesn't work for everyone and that's okay. Bruce Flatt, thank you so much for joining us today.